Hey, welcome to the latest installment of Phoenix Children Live. I'm your host, Peter Balistre, Senior Brand Manager here for Phoenix Children's Medical Group. Uh, today, I have with me Dr. David Addison, Director of Baroneurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Thank you for being here. And she's also, he is also the Chief of Neurosurgery. And also, I have Dr. Angus Wilfong, the Associate Director of Baroneurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital and the Chief of Neurology. So thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. Great to be here, Peter. Uh, also, Ron, to really quickly welcome the Epilepsy Foundation of Arizona. They're here in the room with us. You can't see them, but they're here. So thank you guys for being here with us today. Uh, before we start, uh, as you know, this is live, so you can ask questions of us while we're here in the broadcast. Um, if we can answer them, we will. If we can't, we will answer them after the broadcast. So feel free to ask as many questions as you want. We like that. We want to answer your questions on epilepsy today. Um, also, while we're live, don't forget to give us a like or a love. Uh, if these two distinguished gentlemen have helped a child or helped your child, you know, give us a love too. That would be actually great. So thank you for that. Um, real quick, today we start Epilepsy Awareness Month, November 1st, the whole month of November. Um, we'll be honoring that. Um, starting with tonight, we are going to be kicking off and lighting the hospital purple uh, every night this month uh, in honor of that Awareness Month, so that'd be great. Um, in addition, we are also taking place uh, in a, uh, a epilepsy blog relay this year with Living Well with Epilepsy uh, website. And Dr. Wilfong gets the baton passed first to him uh, tomorrow. His blog will be live uh, at Arizona time at 4.15 in the morning. So if you don't want to get up that early, uh, yeah, you can go after that. But uh, 7.15 Eastern time. So he will be talking about uh, the stigma of epilepsy, which we'll talk about today. But if you want to check it out, hashtag epilepsy blog relay. So with that, that that's kind of the segue actually to start with, Dr. Wilfong, is the, uh, the stigma of epilepsy. Um, I've talked to you a lot about it. You have a lot to say on it, so I wanted to talk to you about that. I think it might be helpful to first understand before you get into that um, how common epilepsy is. Um, a lot of people don't know how common epilepsy actually really is. Seizures and epilepsy end up being um, one of the commonest neurologic conditions that affect people and children. One in ten people will have a seizure at some point during their life. So 10% of everyone you've ever met um, has had or is going to have a seizure. The two times in our life when we're most likely to have a seizure is when we're young and when we're old. So we're enjoying the time in our life when we're least likely to have a seizure, but seizures can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. One in 26 people have an underlying susceptibility for having recurrent seizures, and that's what epilepsy is. So epilepsy affects one in 26 people in America, and uh, it makes it uh, more common than Parkinson's disease, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, and uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease all added together. That's amazing. So it is a very common medical condition. That was my uh, segue to ask you, why doesn't, it, why doesn't epilepsy enjoy the same uh, coverage, media attention, support that the ones that you just mentioned? Well, unfortunately, historically, and as part of many cultures and faith based uh, belief systems, um, people have been persecuted that have had epilepsy. So it's been a long-standing belief that is absolutely not true that people with epilepsy are possessed by evil spirits um, or the devil or a curse has been put on a family that has a child with epilepsy. And those beliefs still exist in society today as, as hard as that is to believe. And uh, it's somewhat similar to uh, the stigma that people with mental health and mental illness uh, suffer as well. And, uh, and epilepsy is a medical condition just like having uh, diabetes or uh, high blood pressure. Um, epilepsy is simply a medical condition that affects the brain mm -hmm. and is in no way related to, uh, to anything that uh, people um, have uh, had curses or anything put on them. Mm -hmm. But because of that negative stigma, people may be embarrassed um, to admit openly that they have epilepsy, and, uh, and Hollywood and uh, person, uh, you know, people, well-recognized people mm -hmm. aren't out there raising awareness for epilepsy. Yeah. So you know, I'm sure it stands out in everyone's mind about the Jerry Lewis uh, telethon and now the firefighters with the boot campaign 
raising money every year for muscular dystrophy, which is fabulous and important because money needs to be raised. Um, but muscular dystrophy is very rare compared to how common epilepsy is. Yeah. And uh, there just isn't anyone, uh, uh, a celebrity that is out there raising awareness uh, and fundraising for epilepsy like there is for so many other medical conditions. Yeah. And I think it relates to this negative uh, stigma that people think about epilepsy. Yeah. Yet there have been a number of celebrities and other well-known persons who had epilepsy, but yet you don't know about it, it's not as publicized as versus other diseases or concerns, whether it be heart disease or breast cancer yeah. or uh, cardiac disease. And you hear about those all the time. Correct. Right? Absolutely. Uh, real quick, as I said, when we get questions, we'll take them. So we did get one, um, and is it, so here's one that just came in. Is, is it true that uh, too much str uh, screen time can cause seizures? Is that a, a myth or is that true? I, well, <laughs> yeah. There is some truth to Do it. Do you want your kids off their screens? <laughs> tell you what you want. Yeah. No, just Hopefully, it's not a video game situation. <laughs> yeah, right. But no, in all seriousness. Well, there is some truth to it. So there are rare forms of epilepsy that affect children and adults, where you can have seizures triggered by certain frequencies of flickering light or like strobe lights. It's something that uh, we test for in every child that is thought to have seizures or is diagnosed with epilepsy. Uh, common test that everyone with seizures gets is an EEG or an electroencephalogram. Mm -hmm. And part of that test is using flashing lights or strobe lights um, at different frequencies and we're monitoring the brain waves. And if someone is sensitive to having a seizure triggered by strobe lights, we'll identify it in the EEG. Okay. And uh, it's rare, but it's something that we do see. Okay. Um, so if we did identify that, then the family would be made aware. And, and then there may be situations of, of watching certain movies or video games that the child would need to avoid. Okay. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that <laughs> is that uh, oftentimes if there's a lot of screen time, particularly at the end of the day, uh, children may not be getting enough sleep mm -hmm. and um, sort of being tired or inadequate sleep or not good sleep uh, can um, lower their threshold for having a seizure. So it doesn't necessarily cause the seizure, um, but it may uh, bring it on if they're if it's been sort of part of a whole sleep disruption uh, situation. Okay, great. Um, keep the questions coming. That's great. Um, so back to kind of the 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 stigma, if you will, and and we talked about how common it is, and and um, uh, you know wh where where it is at in Hollywood and things along those lines. And you mentioned that I think you mentioned a little bit about funding, and I want to touch on that as well. So from a funding perspective. Um, it doesn't probably enjoy what those other ones do, but then kind of the sub part to that question is, um, with regard to pediatric versus adult, uh, is the funding different for, for those or no? So uh, kind of a two-part question. So funding is very limited for research and discovery in epilepsy compared to many other medical conditions. Yeah. Now it's not that we think that money should come but you'd be taken away from another medical illness and, and come towards epilepsy just that we need money donated um, and generated through uh, the NIH and uh, uh, to make discoveries in many areas of medicine. But epilepsy does uh, not get nearly as much funding as other much less common conditions. Okay. Um, so back to my original um, list of conditions that all added together are, you know, epilepsy is more common, but each one of those gets more uh, fundraising through the community and through philanthropy and uh, research funding from the government through NIH um, than epilepsy does. So there's more money that goes to multiple sclerosis, uh, more money that goes to Parkinson's disease, more money that goes to ALS research than goes to epilepsy. Is there, can I interrupt one second? Oh, yeah, so go I ahead. want to ask you a question. So remind me again the statistic for SUDEP for uh, sudden, or ex explain SUDEP and what's the, right. how, how many uh, children die each year of SUDEP. So SUDEP is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy and uh, people can die from epilepsy mm -hmm. and many people don't realize um, how staggering the, the numbers are for epilepsy. So a million people right now in America are living with uncontrolled seizures. Three million people overall have epilepsy and a, and a third of those people will have seizures that medicine just won't control. 
and we're going to talk in, in a minute about some you know really life changing and wonderful treatments for children and adults that have uncontrolled seizures. But if you have uncontrolled seizures, you're at very high risk uh, compared to the general population of having a sudden uh, death where your heart just stops and mm -hmm. you stop breathing. And uh, that most commonly occurs in sleep. And for uh, adults with intractable epilepsy, um, that number is about one in a thousand people will die. Um, so SUDEP is the number one cause of death in, in people with epilepsy. The next most common death is accidental death, so drowning. Um, if you had a convulsive seizure in the swimming pool or in the bathtub, you would sink to the bottom and, and you could drown. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, SUDEP is less common in children, and uh, a recent study showed that overall for the pediatric age group, it's about one in 4,500 children will die from SUDEP. It, it speaks to how important it is to get the seizures under control because the main risk for SUDEP and therefore by dying from epilepsy is having uncontrolled seizures. Yeah. And more people die in America every year from epilepsy than die from breast cancer. Wow. So there's about 45,000 people that die every year from breast cancer, tragically, um, but 50,000 people die every year in the United States from epilepsy. And, and the comparison to that is that there's billions of dollars, and, uh, and again, I agree with Angus that we don't want to take away funding from other areas, but we, we're really here to raise awareness. And, you know, when we look at something, you know, as tragic as pediatric AIDS, um, but yet billions of dollars is spent on research in that area, but that only, actually last year, only about 400 deaths from pediatric AIDS, but yet here we're talking about tens of thousands of people who die uh, from epilepsy, and yet the funding disparity is, you know, 100 plus to one. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why organizations, you know, such as the Epilepsy Foundation, and, you know, not only here in Arizona, but across the country, are so important is to try to raise that awareness, make people aware of really how important and, and how big a problem epilepsy is in our community. And uh, why it's important to you know to support um, you know research and um, awareness and things like that. So. Well, and th that's why we're doing this for this month. And exactly. you'll see that on our on our Facebook page, on our Twitter, all of our profiles at, at PCH at uh, Bear Neurological Institute at PCH. We're going to be talking about it all month. So um, I, I think what's um, important too is that it, it comes back to that stigma is very real then, because I think more more would be out there on it. If it weren't, uh, it weren't for the stigma, and I think one of the next questions I want to talk about kind of affects that is, you know, when we talk about pediatric epilepsy, there is impact to development, whether it's social or uh, academic. Talk a little bit about that because I think that's all too real for a lot of families that have kids that are going through epilepsy. Absolutely, well, seizures have a big impact on people's independence, um, and you know, for people of driving age and for adults. You can't have a driver's license if you have uncontrolled seizures. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to have um, a meaningful job and be employed if you have regular times of unexpected uh, and unpredictable loss of awareness or consciousness with seizures. Mm -hmm. And the same affects children uh, trying to go to school. And if children are having regular seizures, um, the seizures interfere with their ability just to participate in school. If they have a a convulsive seizure at school or uh, a partial seizure with uh, altered awareness, they're often asked to leave school, to go to the nurse's office, or they may go to the hospital, an ambulance may get called, and they miss the rest of the school day. Yeah. And, uh, and some children with uncontrolled seizures can have dozens or even hundreds of seizures a day. And uh, the seizures really interfere with learning and the ability to pay attention and focus and uh, just remember things. Mm -hmm. So seizures, yeah. just the seizures themselves are having a big impact on successful participation in school and getting an education. Yeah, yeah. I and would then, like it. Okay. You know, no, and I was just gonna say, and the medicines are, are a problem too. Because the medicines which we use to try to control seizures, if you're on one medicine at a modest dose, it's, it's generally pretty well tolerated. Yeah. But children with difficult to control or uncontrollable seizures maybe on three, four, five, sometimes even six medicines all at the same time. And the medicines also slow thinking and impair 
uh, awareness and memory. Makes them pretty foggy. It, hey? it, it's a big fog. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the whole goal of the medicines is to calm the brain mm -hmm. to try to prevent the seizures from occurring. Yeah. You know, I liken it when I talk to families and tell them that, you know, when they're on that cocktail of medicines, mm -hmm. it's like being on a number of martinis. Yeah. And trying to learn and try to interact and try to have, you know, develop is, is very difficult if you're, if you're fogged. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just from the medicines. Yeah. The seizures themselves, as, as Dr. Wilfong has pointed out, they're an interference of normal electrical activity in the brain. So it'd be like, and I'm going to be dating myself, but watching TV where you had all the static on the TV. Yeah. You might be able to see the picture, but it's not as clear. It's not as defined. It's not the same type of rich developmental and uh, stimuli that we would otherwise get. Yeah. And so when you're having these seizures, and especially if you're having them, sometimes you don't even know you're having them. There's these sort of ongoing interference with your electrical activity. Yeah. It doesn't allow you to not only absorb that stimuli, but then encode it and be part of new connections. and more functional, more normal connections. And then I would lastly say that, you know, seizures can also beget new seizures. Mm -hmm. uh, the brain doesn't know, you know, that that electrical circuit that's going off is normal or abnormal, and it becomes more efficient at developing that circuit. And so in some children and adults, um, kind of the more seizures they have, the better they are at getting seizures. And so it, it tends to worsen over time, and so all of these different issues become magnified. And I think one of the great things about um, the line of work that I do here is I get to, to talk with um, doctors like these guys. And, and one of the things that I didn't even know uh, was that uh, there's a metastasizing that happens with epilepsy. So when you have a young, it, it's, it's just going to basically keep happening, keep growing. And I think with that in mind, I, I think, um, and we talked about this too before, is what happens when you have cancer, right? You, you want to get it out, right? We, so if there's uh, epilepsy in a child, um, I think a lot of families um, struggle with what to do. And you know, when we talk about um, brain surgery, it's a, scary, it's a scary thing. So what's the fear uh, associated with epilepsy surgery? Um, when, when, someone, uh, when you talk to family about that, and that's a possibility at that point, um, well, how do they feel about that? Well, I mean, the biggest fear, and and, and not an un, unreasonable fear is is the fact that you know uh, doing brain surgery will change you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the the biggest question I get, you know, you know, are they going to be the same afterward? Or, you know, they, and and I would say the biggest relief that I give to families when you know the child wakes up after surgery and then is that oh they got the same personality and they're giving me a hard time mm -hmm. or, you know <laughs> yeah. and, and those kinds of things and. You know, I mean, there are times where we know that, um, you know, that there may be a motor deficit or, a, you know, a vision deficit or something like that. By virtue of where you're operating. By where we're operating, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. But most importantly is, is it going to change their personality? Is it going to change who they are and, you know, the child that they love and stuff like that? And, you know, when we can reassure them that that's not going to be the case, yeah. uh, I think that there's some sense of relief. But even getting to that part of the conversation and actually believing you, yeah. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, the Hollywood and the media, mm -hmm. you know, of, you know, people are not the same, right. you know, after trauma to the brain or, and surgery in some ways is a, is a truly a trauma to the brain. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so, so we're, you know, we're talking about surgery in the, in the context of uncontrollable seizures. Mm -hmm. So when, when a child is first diagnosed with epilepsy, we, we put them on a medicine and we're hopeful that that medicine is going to work. And if that first medicine doesn't work, then we'll try our next best medicine. But if, if the child continues to have seizures after two medicines, we know that medicines just aren't going to control that child's epilepsy. Yeah. So at the moment that a child has failed two medicines, that's when we say the child has treatment resistant or medically intractable or medically uh, refractory epilepsy. And children with intractable epilepsy need to be evaluated to see what the next best treatment options are. And we're always hopeful that surgery, like Dr. Adelson's been speaking about, is going to be an option. And for many children that have uncontrollable epilepsy, surgery is a great option. And it ends up that epilepsy, of all the different neurologic conditions we've been talking about, epilepsy is the only one we can cure. So we can't cure muscular dystrophy. We can't cure Parkinson's disease. 
we can't cure uh, migraine headaches, but we can cure epilepsy. And it requires you know, careful mapping and skilled surgeons like Dr. Adelson going in and, and knowing where the critical parts of the brain is and preserving those and taking the epilepsy away. And uh, we'll be speaking in a minute about some minimally invasive ways of, of achieving that same thing, of taking the epilepsy away from the brain. And, uh, and it's, it's so amazing to see children after they've had their epilepsy cure and how much brighter, more alert and, uh, they are. And it's like turning a switch off, that we turn the epilepsy off and the brain wakes up and the children do so much better. And many times we're able to take them off all of their medicine and it's, it's just transformative. But as you mentioned, the epilepsy can spread and everyone is familiar that if someone tragically is, is diagnosed with a tumor anywhere in their body, a brain tumor, uh, a breast cancer, prostate cancer, that it's a key to treat it early. Mm -hmm. Because you can cure cancer if you catch it early, but everyone knows that um, the clock's ticking and if there's a delay in diagnosis, the cancer might have spread. Right. And then it's metastasized and then you can no longer cure it. And the same holds true with epilepsy is that you know, epilepsy, when it begins, it's usually in a fairly defined place. And if, as the seizures continue to send those abnormal electrical circuits in the brain, the brain can pick up on those circuits and reinforce them and not only make the epilepsy stronger or more severe in that place, but the epilepsy can also spread to the other side of the brain. And if you have seizures coming from both sides, then we're not going to be able to cure it with surgery. Yeah. You've taken yourself out of that pool, and basically. That's right. yeah. So, so there is a window of opportunity that is optimal to be able to cure epilepsy. Well, let's talk about um, let's talk about surgery. I, I think one of the things that when I was kind of putting this together, and you you uh, brought up a great uh, point that I want you to be able to talk on is when when you uh, approach a family for surgery. Um, what are the what are the goals of epilepsy surgery that you're going to outline? Um, with the family? Well, again, it depends on what type of epilepsy they have and where we believe the epileptic focus may be. Um, but, you know, uh, the goals are we try to create, you know, adequate expectations. And the adequate expectations would be is, is, is this something that we can truly take out and take out safely mm -hmm. and uh, thus cure them? Um, versus, well, we, we believe that this is a major generator of, of seizures and and so our surgery is really focused on lessening the seizures and so that maybe medications or diet or uh, neuromodulation may work better. Okay. Um, so, you know, there are times where, um, and in sort of answer to a question that just came to us, you know, is it normal to have seizures after surgery? It depends. It depends on, you know, whether, um, number one, whether we felt like we could get um, the whole seizure focus. Uh, the second would be is that after surgery, the brain is actually still quite irritable. Mm -hmm. um, so they can often have seizures in the early period after uh, surgery, but then go on and not have seizures later on. Mm -hmm. um, the other is that there could be other seizure foci. So, you know, the, the primary one may have been the one that we could measure and see and be able to operate on, um, but there may be other generators or other parts of the network that uh, become more active and that's why we don't take people off medicines right away after surgery is because we're worried first about you know the irritability mm -hmm. but the second is is if we can keep those other generators calm and maybe let them die away in the sense that you know use it or lose it so yeah. if the seizure network is not being used then hopefully those connections will die back right. and we'll be able to wean off medicines later on. So an, an analogy okay. I like to use about expectations for being for when the seizures are going to stop. Um, these uh, seizures are being generated by a network. So it's an abnormal circuit of electrical activity in the brain. And it's going around and around and around. And that circuit is being driven by the focus of the epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And our goal with epilepsy surgery is to take the focus away. But that circuit still exists. So it's somewhat analogous to a train going down a track. Um, the goal of surgery is to disconnect the train from the engine or 
or shut the engine down. Mm -hmm. But if you shut, turn the engine off and don't put the brakes on, it's going to take miles and miles for that train to gradually come to a stop. From coasting, yeah. And so that circuit is generating the, the seizures. We destroy the engine or take the engine away. That circuit is going to gradually wind down. And sometimes it winds down very quickly and children don't have any seizures after surgery. The, it's pretty common and not unexpected to have a few seizures in the first month after surgery. Yeah. And in the official classification that is used internationally about outcomes for epilepsy surgery, we don't count seizures in the first month after surgery just because that circuit is still so active. Mm -hmm. um, seizures after a month after surgery, then we're starting to wonder about whether we really got all of the engine or some of the engine or a different engine um, might be active. Okay. But in general, we give it about six months of time to let that circuit run down um, and seizures at any point during those first six months doesn't mean that the surgery won't ultimately be a cure. Oh, that's a good analogy. Um, I think the other thing too is, um, is epilepsy surgery is kind of following what a lot of other surgeries are becoming. Um, the, the trend would be right less invasive, less risk, and, and better outcomes, right? So talk a little bit about kind of um, what we're doing to follow that trend and what we're doing at Bear Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's um, for epilepsy surgery with that in mind. Well, I mean, it's really a tribute to, you know, Dr. Wilfong and his colleagues that, you know, the, the best way for me to succeed, um, you know, in a surgical procedure is, is really to know where that seizure focus is with more precision. You know, in, 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 I hate to date myself, in the old days, and I'll put that in quotes, <laughs> you know, kind of bigger was better. Yeah. Uh, and that was because we often couldn't define where the seizure focus was exactly. And so as a result, we had to take more to try to get a cure or to get a better outcome. Mm -hmm. As we are improving our ability to diagnose and target where these uh, seizure foci may be, now we can, and we also know where important and normal connections are, we can come up with strategies to uh, avoid dysfunction but target the seizure focus. And so with new technologies, that's really sort of our goal, our ability to diagnose and better target where the seizure focus may be and then get there in a safer, more minimally invasive uh, way in order to, to cure that. Yeah. Um, great example of that is, is really technology that uh, Dr. Wilfong pioneered, which was the use of stereotactic laser ablation, and where if we know where there is a specific target or a specific lesion, uh, we can place a laser probe right in that uh, area in order to uh, ablate that tissue, which we previously would have done with a scalpel or other instru instruments, uh, but now we can use a laser uh, in order to ablate that tissue without disrupting all the tissue getting down to that level. And when so we say ablate, we're meaning burn, essentially, right? Basically melt it away and, yeah. and, and remove it from uh, function. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's done through MRI as well? That's right. We okay. use, again, because of our improvements in imaging and our ability to see the anatomy of the brain, where the normal tracts and fibers of the brain are, where blood vessels are, so that we can avoid these important structures and place our laser probe in the most minimally invasive way um, as possible uh, in order to get to the tissue that's causing the problem. And we saw this, we've done uh, uh, a number of them already here, and it's, you're doing these in real time, which is the amazing part of it. You can literally see what's going on in, in the child's brain at the time with the ablating, and you can literally see what you're trying to, what your target is. Right. That's pretty amazing. And the opening of the skull is just three millimeters. So instead of having to open the skull with a traditional surgery, Dr. Adelson is introducing the laser probe through just a tiny little drill hole. Yeah, and I want to highlight that, I mean, this is a wonderful new technology and that it now has opened the door for many, many more patients that previously, because maybe their lesion was in a very deep area that we couldn't do safely, et cetera, it opens the opportunity for more patients to have this type of approach, as well as some patients that we previously may have done open, we can now do with this probe. Not all patients, though, are ideal candidates, and um, I would 
I would defer to, to Dr. Wolfong to explain kind of what is the, the ideal candidate for these um, procedures. Yeah, who, I who is the ideal candidate for that? Well, when we think about the different types of epilepsy, and there's hundreds of individual different types of epilepsy, they all fall into two main categories. Mm -hmm. Some people have what we call generalized seizures with a generalized epilepsy. And in those individuals, the seizures are everywhere in the brain. They're not coming from one particular place. They're coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. So people with generalized epilepsies aren't candidates for regular curative type of surgical procedures with the laser or with the craniotomy. The other category in the more common group of epilepsies are focal or partial onset seizures and focal epilepsies. So these are where the seizures are starting in one particular place and then staying there, or they may start there and then spread to other parts of the brain. So it's the, the children with focal epilepsy that are candidates uh, for having surgery. The children that are the best candidates that have the highest probability of cure are children that have an abnormal MRI that correlates with where the seizures are coming from. So they have a tumor that is causing the seizures, and we can see the tumor or a scar, or a developmental abnormality that we call dysplasias. Um, and if we can see those, uh, or see that abnormality on the MRI scan, and the seizures are coming from there, and when we record seizures, we can tell that they're coming from that abnormality, those are the children that have the highest probability of, of cure. It doesn't mean that if you don't have an abnormality, we can't do surgery. Those children are referred to as having non-lesional epilepsy, where there's not something on the MRI scan. Um, it, and we have the technology and the sophistication here to use other tests that help us understand where uh, the seizures are coming from. And that includes things like PET scanning, um, SPECT scanning, um, MEG scans, and different ways of localizing uh, where the seizures are coming from we don't see a physical abnormality. And uh, even if children have more than one abnormality, you know, things like the laser allow us to target more than one abnormality um, to stop the seizures. So if a child isn't a, a candidate for, for surgery, uh, and, and that happens, obviously, um, first of all, real, the, the two-part question again, why wouldn't they be a candidate for, for epilepsy surgery. But then second, um, if they're not, let's talk about kind of that next level of, of treatment, um, neuromodulation, you mentioned it before. Um, so let's start with first, why uh, wouldn't a child be a, a, a candidate for epilepsy surgery? Well, if they have a generalized epilepsy. Yeah. Um, if despite all of our testing, we just can't really clearly localize or define where the seizures are coming from. If the seizures are coming from just too many places, so it's, it's not focal, it's not generalized, but it's multifocal, coming from several different places. Mm -hmm. And then the, the least common reason, but it, it still occurs, is that the seizures are coming from a critical region in the brain. And, and how would you define that? So it's a region of the brain that is responsible for a specific function. So for example, my ability to speak and communicate, I'm using a small area on the left side of my brain to be able to communicate. Okay. And if I had seizures coming from that area, um, we wouldn't always, sometimes we, we make sacrifices, uh, but generally we wouldn't want to trade losing the ability to speak for stopping the seizure. Yeah. And if the seizures were coming from the motor control area, it might result in a paralysis would be the price to pay for stopping the seizures. Right. Now sometimes the seizures are truly life-threatening and with careful discussions with the families we, we just agree that we're going to need to stop the seizures to save the child's life, right. um, but the child is going to wake up with a deficit yeah. now or a disability of some kind. Now that's not usual and the vast majority of children that um, will have surgery will wake up seizure-free and in every other way be exactly the same as they were before. Okay. Um, and kind of that next part of it was, okay, so now you determine with a family that um, the surgery isn't a possibility, and then we talk about neuromodulation. 
uh, and the, there's a couple different kinds of neuromodulation. Let's talk about what neuromodulation is, and then let's talk about the, the two different types that we that we're, we're looking at here. Well, I mean, neuromodulation is you know with a seizure, um, you know, the electrical activity of the brain um, changes and, and becomes disruptive. Mm -hmm. And so, what neuromodulation tries to do is to try to interrupt that interruption. Yeah. And so, um, it can be done. Indirectly, which is what a vagal nerve stimulator does. It's a, a placement of electrodes in the, on the vagus nerve in the neck, a little pacemaker on the chest. And what that does is, um, in a, at least up until recently, um, was very focused on just kind of creating an environment of disrupting that disruptive electrical signals. Mm -hmm. um, the other is uh, responsive neurostimulation, which is uh, uh, where electrodes are placed actually in the seizure focus in the brain, mm -hmm. um, again, for reasons that Dr. Wolfong has already pointed out, it's not a good surgical candidate to remove. We can place the electrodes in the focus or in the area of the focus that allows us to first record that the seizures are occurring and then giving a stimulation to try to uh, interrupt that uh, those electrical signals. Now. That is sort of a, a newer generation of neuromodulation where we're getting better at detecting abnormal yeah. electrical activity, and that could be done directly, as I mentioned, with the, the RNS, the responsive neurostimulation, um, or it can be done indirectly with now the vagal nerve stimulators pick up changes in heart rate that correlate with seizures, and as a result can give them extra stimulation through the vagus nerve uh, to try to improve that. And I think that's where uh, we will start to see improved technologies creating these sort of what we call closed loop systems, mm -hmm. the ability to first detect and then give a uh, stimulus to try to interrupt the seizure from occurring. So there, the kind of the new, the not the new, but the word uh, with with neuromodulation now is the, is the customization. Um, we talked a little bit about that where um, before it was kind of almost one size fits all treatment with neuromodulation, but now. Um, because we know that you know there, uh, a seizure may occur more at night or more in the daytime or sitting or pr uh, prone, these neuromodulation, uh, the, the new neuromodulation um, opportunities can kind of work with that, right? Is that kind of kind of the next, like you were saying, the next generation of that? Um, what 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 are we doing with that, and what do we see that? How is that helping in terms of um, kids that are getting these? Well, it really allows customization of the type of stimulation um, specifically to that child's type of epilepsy. Yeah. So just as you were saying, some children have their seizures only when they're asleep or only when, when they're awake. And we can customize the programming um, towards that type of epilepsy. Yeah. The other advantage of um, the latest version of the vagus nerve stimulator is because it's measuring the heart rate, um, it can detect when the heart rate goes up, but it can also detect when the heart rate goes down. And, uh, and we know that patients that are at risk for SUDEP, the sudden unexpected death, that often occurs at night when the person, the child or the adult is sleeping and their heart rate goes down. And, uh, and it's most likely to occur when people are laying face down when they're laying on their back. Mm -hmm. And so the vagus nerve stimulator can detect if someone is laying face down or face up, and it can detect heart rate decelerations or decreases. And so when we're reviewing the information that the vagus nerve stimulator has gathered, we may see that when the child is sleeping at night face down, that their heart rate is having these times when it goes way down, and that may be an indicator that that person is at risk of having SUDAP, mm -hmm. and then we could you know, take measures with, you know, changing in sleep positions or changing medicines at night or doing something to try to uh, prevent SUDEP from happening. So, lots of expertise between these two gentlemen, but it's a, a huge team effort, right? We have a, a really amazing epilepsy program at Bear Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's, and I want to just touch on that before we end up. I, I know we're over time, but I wanted to make sure that we, we um, cover everything because there's so much to talk about. Um, but 
we have a, a really important mission and vision here, and I, I know you wanted to get that out there, but I also want to talk about the team as well, but I wanted you to start off by saying what the mission and vision of, of Barron Neurological Institute is. Sure. All of us here at Barron Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital, and that includes the physicians, the nurses, the administrators, the MAs, uh, anybody in health, uh, the executive assistants, the administrative assistants, across the board, we all want to cure children of their neurological diseases and disorders. Yeah. And we want to do that so that they can have a happy and healthy quality of life. And so we build each of our programs to encompass that sort of 360 vision, which is everybody takes, uh, takes part in that care. And it's not just a neurosurgeon or a neurologist, but it is, it's the psychologists, the neuroradiologists, the social workers, the psychiatry, the, the staff. We try to create all of our processes yeah. really to improve you know, the, the experience, which is already tragic as it is and, yeah. and often very difficult. And so you know, we try to achieve, achieve that, um, that mission through our vision of really providing state-of-the-art care, which we've talked a bit, a bit about today, mm -hmm. but also be at the leading edge of technologies and research, as well as education. And that's a, another big reason that we do this, is not just educating other doctors and nurses, et cetera, but educating the community and making everybody much more aware of the, the problems that we encounter, for example, in this case, epilepsy, yeah. so that we all can be better advocates for these children with epilepsy, and, and that's why it's so important. And so when we talk about a comprehensive epilepsy program, it is just a wonderful example of how we do this, you know, here at, um, at Barrow at Phoenix Children's. And not just in November, the epilepsy, right? <laughs> so we want to make no, sure that we're... just for one month, <laughs> yeah. After that... We want, yeah. to make sure, <laughs> we want to make sure that we're doing this um, year-round. And I think the, 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 your point has been proven by the fact that we're a, uh, NAEC, National Association of Epilepsy Centers, level four program, right? What, what, does, that, what does that mean to the, to the layperson that might be wondering, well, if we put that out on the website, what does that mean? Well, there's a national registry of epilepsy centers, and uh, there's four levels, level one, which is the, the lowest, and level four, which is the highest. And there's only a handful of level four centers across the country that are pediatric centers, and, and we're proudly one of them. Yeah. Um, and it takes a level four center to be able to offer the RNS system. Mm. So the, uh, you can only uh, provide the responsive neurostimulation if you're a level four center. Okay. And so we're uh, the only one in the region that uh, is a level four and can offer a fully comprehensive uh, program uh, for all the different types of surgery for epilepsy, all the different medications, uh, the ketogenic diet, which uh, we uh, didn't really talk too much about, but uh, the diet is, is a very important therapy for ch some children that have uncontrollable seizures, um, usually children that can't benefit from brain surgery. And, uh, and there are um, a couple of rare diseases of the, the child's metabolism where the only treatment for that condition um, that's life-saving is the ketogenic diet, and they need to be on that diet therapy for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Wolfong has really pointed out, it, it's not just that, you know, you know, whether you gain a level or not. It's a recognition of the level of expertise that exists. It's not just that they have, you know, a neurosurgeon and a couple of neurologists. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's really that whole team. And to, to be a level four really means that you got that team together, um, and then importantly that they have that unique experience. So uh, Dr. Wolfong mentioned about the ketogenic diet. It's not just about putting them on ketosis or putting them on a ketogenic diet. You know, you need dietitians that have particular expertise. It's mm -hmm. not like a, just like, you know, I have a, a expertise in epilepsy surgery. I don't do every single type of neurosurgery. Right. Um, it's important to have that expertise. Our dietitians are not just basic dietitians. Yeah. They're dietitians that have specific expertise in being able to, to, to uh, monitor, to deliver, to instruct, to oversee you know, these patients uh, that are getting uh, the ketogenic diet. Yeah. Similarly, you know, there's a uh, yes, in, in neurology residency, you learn how to handle patients with seizures, but it's unique individuals such as um, Dr. Wilfong and his team of neurologists who are epilepsy specialists. They're yeah. individuals who 
understand who are, are, are at the forefront of treating and managing the medical, the surgical, the neuromodulation, and all of those different types of patients. Yeah. And, and that's why um, it's so important that you put together a program. Um, and it's nice to be recognized as a level four. The recognition is nice, but it, the recognition is more so that the, the public can understand what are they dealing with. You yeah. know, when they, what should their expectation be when they come to a place like ours? Or if they go elsewhere, they should be asking, well, what level epilepsy center are you? Yeah. If they say, well, we're a level two because we've got all this expertise, well, what's the difference? And, yeah. and we have to become um, more aware and we have to uh, educate more, and that's why we do these, these things, is to really make sure that everybody is, it understands you know, what the differences are, and what makes our center unique, yeah. not just here in Phoenix, but in Arizona, actually even in the Southwest, because there is no other pediatric level uh, four center for epilepsy anywhere in, the, in this part of the country. Region. Yeah. So. One other thing I wanted to touch on real quickly is uh, the research aspect of, uh, for what we do with epilepsy. Um, so not only are we treating and, and, we're, and we're teaching and we're monitoring with our pediatric epilepsy units um, and all the, the great doctors that work there, uh, but we're also doing research. Uh, right. what, what are we doing in terms of research for, for epilepsy and, and how are we pioneering and leading the way that way? Well, we really want to not only provide and offer the highest level of current therapy for epilepsy, we want to lead the way in discovering new ways to treat epilepsy better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have a number of initiatives. We're working on uh, two brand new medicines that really, I think, will be uh, transformative in, in helping certain types of childhood epilepsy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Borwinkle, is a world leader in uh, using a new type of uh, functional MRI called resting state functional MRI. And uh, it's an amazing, fabulous technology that allows us to localize where these critical functions are in the brain, yeah. what part of the brain the child is using to speak and to learn and to memorize. Um, and uh, it also helps us localize where the seizures are coming from and how they're spreading. So it allows us to see this abnormal circuit in the brain. And that allows us to just, you know, take it to the next level of, of understanding not only how that child's brain's working, but what will be the impact of Dr. Adelson going in and doing the laser or, or surgically removing part of the brain, and how is the brain going to compensate for that, yeah. and how successful are we in stopping those seizures? Um, I think one of the final things I'm going to say is that uh, we it's amazing that, you know, the people here in Arizona have this kind of care in their backyard, but you guys see people from um, outside the state lines, right? You guys have people that are coming in from across the United States, but even globally now. We've had, we have many, many patients that have come in um, from uh, across the, uh, outside the country. Uh, is that kind of, uh, uh, it's a testament to who we are and what we do here, right? Absolutely, I think, um, you know, we've seen uh, patients from uh, Europe, from Middle East, South America, Mexico, Asia, Asia. That's right, and uh, you know all of these different areas. It's uh, recognition of, of the wonderful work you know that can be done in a center like ours with, with the expertise that we have, um, and uh, and it's it's sometimes fascinating to me, and uh, and uh, you know it's a little bit of a bugaboo to me that, uh, and I've used this phrase before. Um, there are many times in this city and in the state where people will spend more time researching, you know, looking for a new car mm -hmm. than they would on researching, you know, where to get the best care. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, it's clear that the internet has, has given us many opportunities mm -hmm. to spread the word of, of what we do and how we do it, and people then can make decisions about, you know, who they're, who's the right doctor for them to see. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when it comes to, you know, the, the risk of your child dying or, you know, or being permanently disabled, um, you know, it really behooves uh, individuals to um, research, you know, these type of issues and, you know, whether it's us or other, you know, more expertise, uh, expert centers, I think uh, is very important. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that, 
we're, we're very proud of when we get uh, people from around the world who want to come and use our services. And it, um, But similarly, we, we also want to be able to provide uh, the most expansive and, and comprehensive care to those locally. And it's, it is worth driving you know, 15 to 30 to 50 miles or even a little bit more to, yeah. c to come to a place like this. And, um, you know, and uh, I can honestly say that it, you know, it's truly an honor and a privilege to work with someone like uh, Dr. Wolfong and, you know, personally would send my children to him. And, and you know, and, and that's what, if I have that type of relationship and, and um, expectation, then, you know, and for someone in the know, then I, I, I think very highly of obviously our program and our, and our people. And obviously I may be a little bit biased, but, Just a uh, but it, you know, touch. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's really in working with individuals yeah. uh, like Dr. Wolfong who really shown me new ways and new approaches and new thinking. And um, to me, that's, that's, that's golden. Yeah, well, feelings mutual. And again, I want to thank you guys both for being here today. I really appreciate that. I'm sure we uh, got a lot of great questions coming up. We answered a few during the, the broadcast. Don't forget to watch for Dr. Wilfong's uh, blog tomorrow. If you want at 415, if not, that's fine too. But then on November <laughs> 20, right, you'll be up. You are always up. And then on November 21st, uh, Dr. Adelson's blog about the technology, a lot of what we talked about today as well. Um, Next Phoenix Children's Live is what to expect during your cardiology visit. That's with Dr. Puntel. Do you know who Dr. Puntel is? Mm -hmm. All right, good. It's Friday, November 3rd at noon. So thanks again. Again, give us the questions. If you have questions, we'll answer them. So again, thanks, Dr. Wilfong, Dr. Addison. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. All right, really you too. And thanks for the Epilepsy Foundation for being here too. So thank you.